it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce you today to this wonderful program uh, and to the wonderful person who's agreed to uh, join us, um, Ms. Uh, Smriti Keshari, uh, whom I will introduce to you momentarily, but it's really a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Um, so just to remind everyone that today's program is being recorded. Uh, and at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Kate Seaman, the Assistant Director at the Baha'i Chair for her work in assisting us to organize today's program. Um, I'm also pleased that this program uh, is uh, a collaboration, a co-sponsorship with the Phillips Collection, a private museum in Washington, DC, uh, and it's this event today is a part of a larger event, and I want to explain that to our viewers. Uh, it's a part of a program that also is co-sponsored with the Phillips Collection and the All Souls Church, um, and it happens tomorrow evening at the museum. So those of you who are in the Washington, D.C. area, I hope you will uh, go over to the Phillips Museum and attend this wonderful program. So it's October 27, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. And it's where the chief curator, Elsa Smithgall, moderates a conversation exploring art's role in addressing nuclear war abolition, peace, and reconciliation. Panelists include Leslie King Hammond, Mel Hardy, and of course, Sriti Keshari. The program includes poignant musical reflections, and you can find uh, out more about it by going to the uh, website uh, of, the, of the Phillips Collection. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, guest and today's program, and I want to at the outset explain that uh, I will introduce our guest and the program, then we will view the, you know, the, the film, The Bomb. Then we will come back for a Q&A session where Ms. Keshari will be uh, available to answer all of our questions. So with that, if I could just say a little bit about this wonderful uh, film and very thought-provoking film that we're going to watch momentarily. Ms. Keshari presents us with an intriguing, beguiling arrangement that mixes beauty, militarism, destruction, and death in a fascinating cocktail of human habitation, mishap, greed, and innocence. What makes her efforts so particularly stunning are the subtle, difficult to trace ways in which we are all held to a kind of shared justice, but in a melody of human tenderness, human foibles, and human weakness. We witness the wonderful, terrible, and amazing things humans can build, even to their own destruction. It all makes for a fascinating experience, which accomplishes what art should do, pose questions without easy answers, invite connections, little understood or realized, and makes us complicit, participants really, in the grander gestures. Ms. Keshari's The Bomb also reveals the cunning ways in which artists can bring their unique perceptions to the issue facing our world. Today's presentation highlights the fact that great art engages the broad, not just the particular. Art's insight at their best do not as much tell us what to do as they tell us how to view ourselves, the world, our dreams. So with that, I'd like to just say that the Baha'is shares interest in these um, matters align with our own investigation of human nature. We seek to know for the sake of peace, what are those things that motivate human beings? We desire to discover those things that 
comfort us, that bring us together, that make it more likely that humanity will cooperate and build a better world. We desire to know how the truths of humanity can speak to the broader platform of thoughtful assembly where more voices can be heard, ensuring that the full chorus of a rising humanity can present itself. Even as an academic institution, we seek to follow the best insights that art provides in order to not look only for simple proximate solutions, but the enduring existential realities we all crave. So with that, let me just tell you about our special guest. Um, Ms. Sriti Keshari is an Indian American multimedia artist and filmmaker whose work covers a spectrum of moving image from traditional linear filmmaking to art installations. She brings an experimental approach to exploring underrepresented themes and experiences outside the mainstream. She is an artist in residence with the National Theater in London and both BAM and Pioneer work in Brooklyn. Her work has been supported by the MacArthur Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, Ford Foundation, and more. She has spoken about art and social change at the United Nations, BBC, SXSW, Bloomberg Philanthropy, and TED. She was a TED Prize finalist and 2016 Foreign Policy's Global Creative Thinker. Most recently, Ms. Keshari's Disintegration premiered at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Again, something else that we should all seek to find and, and watch. As you can imagine, it's really a great pleasure for us to have this opportunity to have her show us this important uh, film of hers. And, and uh, what we'll do now is go ahead and screen the bomb. Amazing. 
uh, amazing, truly amazing film and um, groundbreaking in so many ways because the topic is so difficult to cover and yet you've done a brilliant job. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Keshari. So I will now turn over the time to um, Kate Seaman to conduct and moderate the Q&A session. Thank you, Hoda. Um, so we have a number of questions from the audience already, so I will just dive straight in if that's okay. Sounds um, great, yeah. Great, so the first comes from Malik Wilson. Um, thank you for your talk and your film. For artists, how can the role of beauty be shown? Must an artist do more, or is her job only to reflect the world back on itself in a sense? I guess I'm asking about the role of art, of the artist, and of beauty in and to the world. Hmm. That's, a, that's a really interesting question. It actually makes me think about, um, you know, one time I had someone ask me this question. It always stayed with me. It was a, it was a, at a talk in Paris after a screening of the bomb, and she um, she had raised a question, and she said, "I feel like an artist, but I also feel that it's selfish, and that I should be hitting the streets." So how how do you grapple with that? With you know this idea of, as you said in your question, creating the art reflecting it back and then doing more. And I think, you know, we're often led to believe that in a way that politicians are the only ones who can imagine the future, shape the future. But that's really, that's false because in so many ways, it's really for artists to imagine that future, not just politicians, you know, or policyholders. We're not just almost holding up a mirror, but we're also holding up a hammer. Um, by creating the work, you're not just reflecting society, but by, by shaping it, because the work in itself shows the, um, how important something is to, to the people. And to, I think in a way, I always thought about that of like, is that a selfish act? And, and I think it is uh, in a way, you know, but what does it mean to be selfish? It's like to be able to give yourself the time and the space and the depth to understand why something has really stayed with you and what do you want to do or say about it you know the bomb really in terms of the origin story and I can talk about it a little bit you know it all came forth after I read a book by the author Eric Slosher who's the co-creator of this project with me he wrote the book Command and Control which was about the history of nuclear weapons in in the United States and the accidents and incidents and the book left this profound effect on me. And it made me feel both quite angry and quite sad. Um, you know, I think uh, sad because I couldn't believe this nuclear reality that we live in, in a world with, you know, 13,000 nuclear weapons, that's enough to destroy this planet eight times over. But if you have a planet, if you've destroyed a planet once, you don't have a planet left to destroy seven more times. And so we're just hoarders of these, like, of these machines, of this darkness. They, they think there's this illusion that that can that nuclear weapons can realistically coexist with human existence. We know that one will eventually, and must eventually, you know, one will end the other, and it hopefully it goes in the human, you know, deciding to end nuclear weapons route. And it really, I think, the book and it, it's such a visceral read as well, really made us want to create a, a film and a project like the bomb that isn't just telling people, you know, nuclear weapons are bad um, and these are countries that have them and this is why, because that information is out there, right? We see even the headlines of this morning of Russia conducting nuclear weapon testing. And yet there has been this like complacency or this denial and this complete sort of, there's a lack of a, a deeper connection to them because they are out of sight and they're out of mind. and so the act of making the work um, is a way of igniting, you know, the real, you know, our goal was really to create this visceral and emotional understanding of these weapons. And, you know, and I think so going back to, you know, what is the role of the artist and using even Eric's book as an example, like we didn't know command and control has led to the, to the bomb in some ways. And, you never know when a word, a photograph, a sound, a film, a performance is going to, uh, what ripple it will have. 
And since then, I mean, the bomb has been shown in so many places around the world. It's been a catalyst to have a conversation from people of all different fields, whether it's, you know, with members of Congress, whether it's with like the government of France, whether it's with activists at the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. And I think that that is kind of at its core, this like the this thing that we don't know what change it will cause. But the, I think that's what in so many ways artists get to you know do best. Thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Aspen Brinton. Um, most of the footage seems to be historical. Could you talk about the experience of accessing recently declassified, I assume, footage, uh, foreign footage from other countries, etc., and how you did that? And then since there is some editing of the footage, how much editing was done, how and how did you choose the editing of the historical footage? Um, the sequencing is beautiful and tells the story visually brilliantly, and it would be excellent to use in educational settings should you ever choose to make it available for that. Thank you for your work. Um, these are my favorite types of questions because I just like geek out about the edit and the footage and the process. So the film has, we went through about 400 hours of footage. I don't think there's anyone else in the world that has seen more nuclear weapon footage than Kevin Ford, who was the co-director of the project with myself and Eric. Um, we went through a lot of hours of footage and um, it's, you know, about 30% of it had never been seen before. It was footage that was given to Eric during his 10 years of the writing or in research process of the bomb. Um, and then 70% of it is footage that we had, um, that, you know, we had found from, from all over. Um, in terms of the process in itself, I think we really, um, you know, as you can see, it's like there are these like themes that we take people through. And in the beginning, it starts off with like everything beautiful that which is earth, everything beautiful that in a way we have to lose if we don't, you know, just to set us all as like we are all these human beings on this earth. And then when you get into the down to earth, you see how these like weapons have become this like massive symbol of power. Um, so I, it was this, the process in itself was just, it was really extensive and it's a lot of these, like we knew themes that we wanted to get to and and um, a lot of different like editing and restructuring of how do we bridge that together and finding those like continuities between like, you know, the, the machines um, and some of the ingenuity of the machines um, and, and, and the Manhattan um, uh, Project footage was some that had never been seen before. And to show this idea of like, I mean, this is a moment where it was like this idea of all, it's a perversion of science and there was an innocence to the scientists and the sense that like, we have to do it before Germany. And so when the footage is these like, you know, 20, 20 30 year olds, um, in Los Alamos, like ha just hanging out before before they knew the impact that they were going to have. I think it's getting to, again, to the emotion and to the heart of what was happening to all of those people who who were there. And even the explosions is one part of it. Um, you know, all of the after the accidents, all of the nuclear weapon testing. You know, when you first um, you talked to Bill Perry, who's one of the few people alive who has seen a nuclear weapon test live. And I think when you first see one, there's this sense of awe, right? Because it's like, if you like fireworks to a degree, this is like this huge explosion in the sky and there's a haunting beauty to it. But then as there's like more and more and more, you see the, again, perversion is a word that comes to mind that, that kind of happens. So in terms of the footage, it was like really trying to take people through that journey. Thank you. And that actually feeds into the next question really well from Michael Dola. Um, intrigued by the last line of your contribution to the liner notes of the bomb soundtrack on vinyl. Um, mm -hmm. This is beautiful music about how the world ends. It makes me think of issues of what people have called the nuclear sublime. Part of what that, I, that is, I take, is the problem of aestheticizing these weapons, their footage, etc. How do you think about the concern, or not, that you might have provided an emotionally satisfying experience for viewers on both sides of a monstrous reality? 
I think that, um, you know, I have to say, I don't, I don't know if that, and I wish this was like a live Q and A, because Michael would love to ask you. I, I don't, I'd love to ask you if, if that, of how this made you feel, right? And is, and and I'm assuming not being the person who is maybe um, drawn to nuclear weapons, like did it make you feel like a greater allure to them? Because I don't, I think the film, um, when you go through it as an entire film, you know, I mean, everyone's experience is different, but I, I, I don't think that it, um, it fetishizes or aestheticizes, it shows the, the, uh, the haunting and sheer destruction at the very heart of them. Thank you. Um, and following up to that from Helena Coburn, uh, how do you feel about reconciling the aesthetically engaging aspects of so much to do with nuclear weapons with the sheer horror of their existence? Um, there are also many sexual overtones as filmmakers have known since the 1950s. Also see the use of the term bikini to refer to a swimsuit that would have an explosive effect. Yeah, I mean, um... Well, I'm, okay, what was the, oh, let me just get to questioning again, um, reconciling the engaging aspects with their sheer horror. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's interesting because that's something that, Helena, this is something that we talked about a lot. There's an incredible researcher who's a big influence in a lot of um, my work in this, is, um, Carol Cohn, and she is, she wrote the term, she wrote the paper and kind of coined the term, the, um, the, the kind of sexual nature of nuclear weapons and she wrote this entire paper that talks about the language that's used you know they're called earth penetrating weapon it's burst to burst ratio and the language is something that really has kept people away because there is like both nuclear jargon that feels like oh if you can't talk about it or if you don't know it um then you don't belong in the in the club of like talking about nuclear weapons. And that's something that I, a lot of the people involved in the, um, in the nuclear weapon field now are currently trying to dismantle that barrier of entry because of the language that is meant to keep people apart. Um, and I think that's something that like, I mean, due to the nature of like who made them and, and how they were made that is ingrained in it. And that's again, you know, something that we try to bring out. I mean, there was, there was this entire mentality of mine is bigger than yours, right? And that was the entire us, the US and Russia. So those are, I think, all of the elements that are ingrained in the in the making of nuclear weapons as a whole, as part of our defense. Thank you. Um, so from Barbara Talley, what gives you hope knowing what you know? Um, the video is daunting. <laughs> How do you share this without I making know. people impotent from fear? Yeah, I mean, I that's something that um, we, you know, thought a lot about, and especially thought a lot about towards the ending of the film. And it's something that you know, I, I think about still again and again and again with all these years of being in the nuclear weapon world, is that there is I think the power of our imagination, right, is what led to us being in this point. And it's also the power of our imagination that can help us kind of lead out of that. And there is this illusion sometimes that there's like someone else who's like, who's taking care of it. And it wasn't until learning more and more about nuclear weapons and how it was built and the people who are involved that I think I realized how important it is, no matter who you are, to have a voice in this, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why we also, it's one of the great things about the bomb is that we think of it almost as an anchor event as well. Every time it has been live, there have been a lot of panel discussions, there have been media roundtable discussions, they've been artist initiative. It's also available, someone had asked earlier, um, for educational purposes, it's also available. Um, at universities and high schools. Um, 
And with that, there is an entire curriculum built around what people can do, as well as with the bomb itself. We have a website that talks about sort of the the things that people can do from an education standpoint, from an awareness standpoint, whether it's getting involved with some of the organizations, because I think feeling paralyzed because of the the, the fear or the daunting nature is, um, you know, it, it's a natural first reaction, but there's something that everyone can do, right? Like reading the book, let us, let me and Eric to want to make this and everyone has an agency in this. Exactly. Um, so from Joe Reiner, what do you understand is the relationship of art to politics regarding nuclear weapons, particularly now that Russia threatens Ukraine with their use? It's the relationship with art and nuclear weapons. Um, I can say that in terms of like, what's the relationship with art and nuclear weapons is that art in so many ways is it's like, it's a universal language that you don't have to speak, you know, you don't have to speak a specific language, right? It's something that you can, you can feel and it, and whereas oftentimes when people are talking about like, well, should France have nuclear weapons because they're right in between Russia and the US and for um, just a sense of defense. And I think that you quickly get to this point of actually realizing, you know, at least we traded with the film and said, these are actually machines and these are machines that will that will fail. I mean, these are ancient, ancient machines. These are not machines that are, are targeted, right? Like they kill the effect of them does not just, just affect one little point. Um, and, you know, the International Red Cross has announced a statement that no country in the world is prepared for the actual effect of fallout and of, of nuclear weapon usage. And so these cannot and should not, you know, exist. And so how do we, how do we use art to propel that conversation and to get people engaged in it? Because there's this feeling like I can't do anything. And going back to that idea of like, how do you move many people's mind into this is not, you know, how we're going to deal with our, our politics. It's not a nuclear weapon because it destroys like not just, it, it destroys everyone affected. You know, we've had upwards of, a, I believe it was a thousand broken arrows, which are all of the incidents and accidents of nuclear weapons. And we've lost nuclear weapons off the coast of South Carolina, off the coast of Spain. The, Eric's book talks about an incident where a workman dropped a, a wrench um, and pierced you know, a warhead of a nuclear weapon silo in Damascus. And People didn't know if it had war, you know, if it had like an active warhead or not. And and it was one of, and it could have had such a catastrophic effect. And so that sheer accident of dropping a wrench by a workman is it could have had such a huge effect. And it, you know, it, they're in many ways, they're not logical weapons for us to have. Right. Um, and I think that fits as well with a comment from Janine McKay about the awfulness of the weapons, but also trying to get their head around the huge amount of money that the countries of the world have spent on these, these bombs. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I mean, I, you know, Janine, it's like Congress approved a trillion dollar modernization effort. And I, you know, I'm sure all of us can imagine uh, so many other better ways for Congress to spend a trillion dollars in our country right now. So, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions. Are we okay to carry on? I know we're coming close to the end of time. Yeah, works for me. Okay. Um, so, from Kaifa Jamil, um, thank you for producing this film. It's honestly the most sobering, depressing nonfiction art film I've ever watched. It leaves me speechless. Um, are there any good conventional documentaries about the danger of nuclear weapons that you could recommend as well? Um, so there is a, there is Command and Control, which um, is a film directed by Robbie Kenner, um, and Eric was involved with that as well, and um, it basically talks about the Titan II missile silo and that incident um, in Damascus. I think it's a really good 
way of experiencing, you know, what actually happened. And I, you know, when I'm seeing the film, it's like, we're not too far away from that happening again and and what the profound effects of that are, who are all of the people involved. Um, so I would definitely suggest, yeah, command and control. Thank you. Um, so a, a comment slash question from Juliana. Um, so not a question, sorry, but I certainly thought about and Googled what a nuclear power plant looks like because I began to consider the phallic versus, versus ionic um, a word I learned in that connective moment. Um, also that men were calling all the shots, literally. Um, that was all, thank you. <laughs> um, and then the, the final question from the audience, um, from Begonia is, what are the reactions from the audiences that have watched the bomb and which has been the most memorable for you? Yeah, um, you know, we've had a few, I mean, we've had such a diversity of reactions and the film has been everywhere from like from film festival and art festivals to the, the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony to for members of Congress at the National Academy of Science and the National Mall. And every reaction is so unique and so different. Um, I mean, we've had at moments some people that have um, passed out um, or, or thrown up. Um, there, I, I think that maybe one of the most um, emotional moments that comes to mind is actually in Oslo for the Nobel Peace Prize ceremonies when ICANN, the International Coalition to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, um, were being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. And they're an incredible organization that just have been on the ground, you know, every single day kind of showing up. Uh, and at that moment before they were about to get the award, they all had come through and we had um, a screening and a live performance from the band and a live score. And I think it, it's really, um, it's always so touching to me because in a way the film with everyone who sees this, who's involved in the nuclear conversation and dialogue, it's a reminder of why they got started. And so that was a really, um, a, you know, powerful moment um, that was almost kind of looking inwards to the people who are at the front lines of this conversation of, again, like why, why they do what they do. Thank you so much. Um, and I will say someone wrote this before and I completely agree. Dr. Strangelove should be a documentary, should be called a documentary. <laughs> it is one of the most remarkable films about this topic. And, you. you know, it wasn't originally meant to be a satire. That's not what um, Stanley Kubrick had intended. And when he read the book that inspired the film, Red Alert, and just going deeper and deeper into nuclear weapon strategy, he realized like every single logic was tied to like a logic that didn't make sense because eventually these are these are machines, right? That will fail. And so the fact that it turned out in this like satirical way was like the the only way to kind of portray this this subject uh, matter. <laughs> Thank you. And I think one other thing um, just quickly is how can people access the film now if they wanted to share it for educational purposes or with other groups? Yeah, so there's a few different ways that you can access the film, but on the website, the bomb now, NOW.com, um, uh, all of that is available. It's on um, Netflix but for educational screenings. Um, there's a different path and it's it's all there. The information is there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Professor, thank you so much for your great words earlier on. Oh, like you said, I, I look forward to meeting you tomorrow. Absolutely. I The same here. And thank you so much. Really, you have made an amazing film and we look forward to many more from you. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. As you can tell from the Q&A, people were so engaged and I have a feeling that many of them are going to find ways to also share this movie with others in their circles. So thank you for, mm -hmm. for being with us today. I appreciate it very much. Thank um, you. And I'd like to now just uh, tell our viewers that um, 
Our next event uh, is actually happening next week when we have uh, Professor Susanna Heschel, who is a distinguished professor and chair of the Jewish Studies Program at Dartmouth College. Uh, she will speak on the tenacity of anti-Semitism from the global to the emotional. Uh, it's in person at the University of Maryland for those of you who are nearby, but it is also online for those of you who cannot be in person. Um, we hope you will join us. It's at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, and you can certainly go, go online and sign, sign up for it on our website, and, and we look forward to seeing you then. Again, my thanks to Ms. Keshar, Keshari for the, for the beautiful um, program and your Q&A, which really helped us understand this dilemma. And, and I loved what you said about none, it seems none of this is logical. When it comes to an atomic yeah. bomb, none of it is logical, and I think that's the lesson uh, and, and again, I think it's so important that you expose us to this, because uh, the more we know, perhaps the more we will voice our concern and increase uh, public opinion about these things. Again, thank you, and uh, we'll see you later. Okay. Thanks to our thank viewers. You. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.